r slash no sleep posted by you slash bren will phone out in the night strange and dangerous things dwell avoid them if you value your soul i've always enjoyed the night staying up late into the thick dark of the evening going for a drive while listening to music and having a cigarette watching tv shows or movies in the blue light glow of the television set ordering cheap and greasy food from hole-in-the-wall establishments lit by buzzing neon lights drinking beer or whiskey or wine until my head swims, smoking weed or altering my consciousness in some less usual way. These have all been habitual pastimes for me for many years. By myself or with friends, I love the late hours and the quiet electricity they hold. The slight feeling that I should be in bed, that I shouldn't be out. The whole world is asleep, but not me. It gives just a hint of misbehaving, of being bad, even if what I'm doing is quite plain. I don't care, I love it. But out in the night, strange and dangerous things dwell. I suppose that's part of the allure of it, the heightened risk that we recognize down at the core level of our being, deep within our DNA. Once the sun sets and the darkness falls, the chance of death at the talons or teeth of some stealth and unseen predator, the chance that the world will swallow you whole, like an insignificant little morsel, never to be seen again, is at least tenfold that of daylight. We all know this. It's why so many of us are afraid of the dark. It's why so many of us are, like I said above, excited by it. We venture out into it regardless. Bathed in pale moonlight, we risk life, limb and lucidity. Most of us make it out just fine. Some of us though, pay a dear price for our hubris. Some never return. Some do, but whether this is a more desirable fate is not always so clear. I'll tell you my story and let you decide. It was the late fall of 2006, I was still young, reckless and sure of my immortality. But all of that had started to wane college was over. I had done my traveling throughout the far corners of the earth, run out of money and been forced to return home to my sleepy little town, seated at the foot of the Berkshires, in the far western end of Massachusetts. My high school friends had all moved on to bigger and better places. The few acquaintances remaining had begun to grow older, start families, lose their passion for life and fade into the dull gray background of small town existence. After places like New Zealand, Australia, Fiji, and Thailand, this was a cold and depressing limbo for someone with my taste for living. Life as I had known it was coming to an end. It was time to move on to the bleak and grinding continuance pine for by so many lifeless individuals without so much as one iota of imagination to spur them forward to greater things. I had thought I was destined for greatness, but no. Maybe I was just another victim of the self-esteem movement. Just another poor sap who thought he would be a rock star or a movie god. Just another sad story of disappointment. It hurt. It really fucking hurt. But coming to terms with it was important. So important that I decided to completely ignore it. I spent my nights driving around aimlessly. Listening to strange albums full of weird songs, smoking pot and sipping cheap whiskey. I just wanted to feel rebellious and free again. It was nothing but a dollar store replacement, but it was better than sitting home, watching the same old movies, reading the same old books and dreaming the same old pie in the sky dreams that weren't coming through anytime soon. So I drove. I drove and I drove and I drove. Trying to outrun it all. Slipping through the pale street light like a snake through the velvety black, getting lost on roads I'd never driven before. Finding my way back hours later only after I'd haphazardly stumbled into some area that fit my recollection. This went on for a period of time that is simply nebulous to me now. It felt like months, but was probably more like weeks. I don't know, I really don't anymore. What I do remember clearly is a night that I became hopelessly lost. I went so far down some forgotten old back road, deep in the forested recesses of the hills, that I thought I'd never find my way out again. Part of me hoped I'd die in there. It might have been something to just vanish into some backwoods Bermuda Triangle, never to be seen or heard from again. It would at least be an interesting way to go out. But that wasn't to be. Instead I found out firsthand what kind of demons truly inhabit the night. After driving for hours through mazes of crumbling and forgotten roads inhabited by ramshackle structures more appropriately referred to as dwellings than homes, the road I was on began to slope steeply downward and turned around a sharp bend. The effect was to totally cut me off from the rest of existence. At the bottom of the hill was an open area. A rough sort of cul-de-sac that, instead of having defined edges or curbs, simply melted into the tangled undergrowth that surrounded it. I decided that this was my type of place. Thoroughly abandoned mostly forgotten and completely removed from the rest of the godforsaken world that so disappointed me. I shifted the car into park and leaned back into my seat. Reaching for the radio, 
I turned the little black knob that controlled volume. I opened my windows and let the music spill out into the darkness. It was a kind of drug-fueled jazz that sounded like noise to all but the trained ear and instilled a feeling of approaching chaos and doom in the listener. It fit perfectly. I took a sip of the whiskey I had in the center console and then a pull off the bull that sat quietly next to it. I shut my eyes and let the night fill me up. I had no idea how to get back home, or if I'd even recognize the way if I stumbled upon it in my current state of mind. It didn't matter though. I was enjoying the moment too much. I don't know when I first realized it, but eventually I became conscious of a feeling that the car was drifting slowly forward. I opened my eyes to find that it was indeed creeping gradually towards a large oak at the edge of the clearing. I checked the shifter and found it securely in park. I pressed the brake pedal but nothing happened. I reached down for the handbrake but it didn't budge. I jiggled and shook it side to side with no success. Then, as my head was down trying to figure out why it wouldn't move, I heard the windows begin to roll up on their own. I clawed out with my fingers but was too late. Not that the buttons would have worked anyway. I sat stunned and silent trying to decide just what the fuck was happening. I tried the doors but they were locked and wouldn't open. I was looking for something to smash the window with when I saw the eyes. Eyes in the woods behind the tree, lots of them. I froze. They gleamed like flames in the light of the car's headlamps. I could feel their pull, their beckoning. It reached deep into the furthest recesses of my being, grabbed hold, and dragged me forward. It was the will of whatever was behind those eyes that was moving my car. The bumper finally came to rest against the front of the gnarled old tree. Although that stopped its forward motion, I could still feel the vehicle trying to pull against it. As I sat there in the driver's seat, still as death, the eyes began to move closer. Outlines of bodies began to emerge. The first that took shape was a young man with shards of glass lodged in the skin off his face and the top left corner of his head missing. His left arm was torn off at the shoulder. Bits of blacktop were lodged into both wounds. Next came a woman of about 20, withered thin to the point of emaciation. Her sunken purple eyes glared at me vacantly while her leathery yellow skin sagged around them. Blood flowed from her nose and a needle dangled carelessly out of her arm. Flanking them on the right was a boy of about 17. His white shirt pockmarked with little, charred holes surrounded by large red stains. Blood still oozed rhythmically from the wounds. Behind them streamed countless more. Some showed viscous stab wounds, others clearly met their fate at the hands of boots and fists, even more showed obvious signs of brutal accidents and still others had been slowly sucked dry by chemical indulgences. Each was a gruesome yet clear victim of the savageries of the night. They gradually surrounded the car, like quicksand slowly swallowing a hapless animal. The original three victims lead the pack and stepped right up to the driver's side window, their breath fogging the glass. They stared inward, locking their gaze with mine. Eyes still burning that unnatural yellow-green glow. What do you want? Asked a growling voice inside my head. It was the first victim I saw speaking. I don't know how I knew but I did. I simply sat there frozen, not knowing how to respond. What do you want? The same voice repeated, only much louder this time. I, I don't know. I cried back in a voice I couldn't hold firm. I was petrified. It was like being trapped in a car a mile under the ocean, surrounded by sharks. You do. The woman hissed. I, I, I just wanted to get out. And, and to have some fun. That's it. I swear. That's not what we're asking. Sneered the boy with the gunshots. What is it you want? He yelled it so loud I thought my head would split open. It felt like daggers behind my eyes. I cried and squirmed, squeezing my eyes shut and pressing my hands against my ears. I don't know what you mean. I finally cried out. You do. The woman hissed again. Her voice sounded like meat frying. I could feel searing heat on my skin and inside my brain. No I don't. I shouted back defiantly. I felt anger rising within me. I turned to look at them with a scowl, burying my fear. The one with the head wound and missing arm leaned closer, staring straight into my eyes. He seemed amused. It was as if he was looking right through me and out the other side. A smirk sat on his bleeding face. It widened to a grin. Then it felt like someone injected molten lead into my skull. Pain like I'd never felt before erupted inside me. My brain felt like it was being dissolved in battery acid. I clenched my jaw so hard I chipped teeth. I squirmed and writhed and tried to scream but nothing came out except strained little whimpers. I sat imprisoned in this hell for what seemed like eternity, but was likely only seconds. The pain stopped as abruptly as it had started. Gasping for breath and soaked in sweat, I came back to the situation. What is it that you want? Why are you out here? 
What is it that you are looking for? Growled head wound. I could feel the pain beginning again so I just spoke. I want excitement. I want adventure. I want to have fun again. I don't want to sit in this boring fucking limbo anymore. I can't stand it. I need to get the fuck out. I'm sorry I came here. I'm sorry. The atmosphere became very quiet, like someone turned the intensity down from a fever pitch to a low, foreboding hum. It was somehow worse this way. Head wound grinned again. So did needle and gunshots. So did every single one of them. It sounds like you want to be one of us? Head wound said in my brain. No. No, I don't. I don't want to be like you. I want to live. You want to live? Yes. Then stay out of the night. He said again with a smirk. It's ours. It belongs to us, to our kind. His words echoed in my head as if underwater, as if I were drowning. Okay, I will. I promise I'll never go out again. Just let me go. Please. Then they all stood back. They stood still, gazing off into the distance as if deep in thought. One hive mind jury working together as one to return its verdict. Then Head Woon leaned forward and smiled again. We don't believe you. I'm telling you the truth. I fucking mean it. I'll stay in. I'll be better. I mean it. Your kind never tell the truth, he grumbled. We know. He showed his bloody grin again, then looked around at his grim compatriots. But we'll give you one chance. Thank you. Thank you. Oh God, thank you. I practically prayed to the disgusting thing. However, we must take payment for your trespassing. Otherwise, how will you learn? What? What do you mean? I didn't know I was trespassing, I'm sorry. My pleading screams went unanswered. Instead they all took a large step back, but kept their burning yellow eyes fixed on the car. I felt the pull on the car increase exponentially, pressing the bumper against the tree with staggering force. At the same time, my body was pinned to the driver's seat, as if strapped to a gurney with leather belts. I couldn't move below the neck. The pull on the car kept on growing and growing. I could feel the force multiplying as if something were feeding it rocket fuel. The front end of the car began to crumble. The hood creaked and folded like an accordion, the sound of twisting metal rang in my ears. In spite of it all, the car kept moving forward, the enormous dent in the front end moving closer and closer to the driver's seat. The dashboard cracked. Jagged lines spread through the cheap, thin plastic like bolts of lightning. I watched as the steering column shifted unnaturally to the left, pushing forward towards my leg. The car kept crushing itself against the tree trunk. The steering column inched closer to my knee. I tried desperately to move but my legs may as well have been made of stone. Panicking, I thrashed my head from side to side and screamed like a madman. None of that made one lick of difference. The steering column slowly drove itself into my kneecap. I felt the pressure build, the ache intensify. I screamed louder. With all my will, I attempted to squirm away, but my body wouldn't respond. I felt my kneecap shatter. Still, the car kept pushing forward. It just kept going, mangling itself in my leg. I had lost all semblance of reason or sanity at this point, diminished to nothing more than an animal in a trap. I thrashed until I pulled muscles in my neck, screamed until I tasted blood and ground my teeth until I chipped them even more. Finally the car stopped, the windshield a mere yard from the tree trunk. I looked down at what was left of my leg. It was twisted at a gruesome, unnatural angle, broken in many places, blood steadily flowing from the wounds. In some places, I could see bone. My mind went black. I drifted in and out of consciousness until the rescue team arrived. They say I called them on my cell phone, but I don't remember doing so. Nor can I figure out how I was able to convey to them where I was. The herd of ghosts were gone by the time they arrived, having disappeared at some point during my brutal wait, one more piece of the story that I don't remember. The firemen, police and paramedics all just assumed I had crashed the car. It certainly looked that way, and I sure wasn't going to try to tell them the truth. In the end I was brought to the hospital and stabilized. My left leg had to be amputated. It was just too mangled to be saved. I suppose it was a small price to pay to keep my life. Though it's a constant reminder of that night. I was also charged with driving under the influence and reckless operation. Since, miraculously, this was my first offense and I had paid so dearly for it already, the judge was lenient. I was sentenced to a year of probation and my license was revoked for the same period of time. I also checked myself into rehab as soon as I was physically able. As I write this, 15 years later, 
I have settled down to a plain and simple suburban life in my hometown at the far west end of Massachusetts, nestled in the shadow of the Berkshire Plateau. Things are boring and usual. Like so many others, I've faded into the grey background of the normal Walking Dead existence. There is no more excitement, there are no more wild nights, with friends or alone. I work a well-paying 9 to 5. I have a wife and two kids, a house with a yard, pool and a golden retriever. My life would be considered ideal to many of the dull, shambling stiffs that shuttle themselves through daily life here, but I'm not so sure. I'm alive. I'm well. But the call of the night still beckons to me. The excitement that it holds still sits vividly in my mind, tugging at me like the lingering, psychological withdrawal of a long-gone drug habit. The itch of my phantom limb reminds me daily of my past trespasses, of my old life. If I could go back to it I would. In a heartbeat. But I know what waits for me out there. I know the price I would pay if I were to return. Sometimes I still contemplate it. Sometimes I think it would be worth it. Worth it to venture back out into the inky dark, back out into the electric unknown, back out to stand defiantly, face to face with whatever predators lurk out there in depths of the night.